I am so, so uh, pleased to present uh, Dr. Paul Waldau because he is a colleague of mine here at Canisius College. He's a scholar and educator working at the intersection of animal studies, law, ethics, religion. He's a senior faculty member in our graduate program in anthrozoology. He also serves as the Baker Visiting Associate Professor of Animal Law at Harvard Law School. He's a former director of, this, at, at the director of the Center for Animals and Public Policy and uh, has taught veterinary ethics at Tufts University. He has a doctor of philosophy degree from the University of Oxford, a law degree from UCLA, and a master of arts degree from Stanford University in Religious Studies. He's the author of, and principal ed editor of four books, and I can tell you from watching him every day, he is writing three more uh, simultaneously. <laughs> Dr. Waldau. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to give you an anthrozoological perspective. Now, that's a synonym in the way I'm using it for animal studies or human animal studies. A broad consideration of the actualities, realities of humans, animals, and non-human animals, and how they mix and the very complex problems they raise and how difficult it is to teach about that. Uh, my subtopic here is uh, provocative. Zoos can imprison us. Zoos can liberate us. And let me see if I can give you the basics of why I would create those two intention uh, sub uh, elements of the subtitle. We're looking 50 to 100 years into the future. That's a common effort, a natural effort even, a natural question. But attempting to do this is extremely difficult. I happen to try this in my Harvard Law School class. I've done it for the last 10 years. It's a difficult exercise. It's politically fraught sometimes to try to guess so far ahead especially when you're in on a topic that's being discussed in a highly polarized environment. Um, I'll suggest to you that there are key features in, in the very existence of zoos, the very notion of, of zoos themselves that raise questions that are fundamentally ethical in nature. And um, failing to call out those ethical questions is the kind of thing, if we don't do it frankly and fully, that can imprison us. So that's us imprisoning ourselves if we aren't simply straightforward about the basic issues that zoos can present to us. Um, and yet, think of it, the other element in the subtitle, zoos can lead us, comes from the fact that if we identify and then in good faith convene um, multifaceted groups um, to address these kinds of challenges, we really end up with responsible leadership. And that's what makes, I think, this conference visionary. And it's a pleasure to work with panelists who have thought these issues out in so many different ways and in such detail. Let me turn to the polarized environment and why that's risky. The uh, French thinker, playwright, novelist, Albert Camus, once when he was describing what was happening in the Algerian Revolution in the 1950s, said regarding the polarized discussions, to justify himself, each relies on the other's crime. To justify himself, each relies on the other's crime. Now, some of us know critics of zoos who think that the existence of some bad zoos or some practices they disfavor at the better zoos um, is all they need to draw the conclusion that all zoos should be abolished. And I'll give you a parallel kind of fallacious reasoning that comes from some people I've known and talked to in the zoo establishment and some zoo supporters, and that is that if there are violent acts by some protesters or a failure to state some facts accurately, then that's all that's needed to dismiss all critics of zoos. Now, what's important about this is that if you go through any of the fundamental skills of critical thinking, it's pretty clear how fallacious this approach is generally. It's also very self-serving for one's own cause, and it simply is an unfair way of dismissing your opponents by relying on their alleged mistakes or crimes. Clearly, another problem with this kind of thinking is that our primary responsibility is to actually look at our own actions first, not others' actions, our own actions first, because we are responsible, ethically capable beings, and that is a primary obligation we have as that kind of animal. Now, there are one, is one other set of problems as well, and that is that when you dismiss your opposition in that fashion, what you've done is dismiss the important phenomenon of multiple voices, which is what we have here. Talking to each other and being enriched by your opposition is an incredibly important skill in complex subjects, and certainly 
this is one of them, it helps us all see further and better. So that's again why the conference strikes me as a visionary conference, because we get the chance to talk to people who look at things somewhat differently than we do. Let me turn to the contention that what zoos do is fundamentally ethically charged. Generally, life for captive animals, as John summarized nicely, is at times but a fraction of their life in the wild. It involves domination, coercion. Um, that's, that fact is a direct result of intentional actions by us, and such intentions create ethical dimensions for us as the kind of animal we are. They simply have an ethical cast. We can't ignore them. If we ignore them, as I've suggested, we imprison ourselves in a sort of self-inflicted ignorance, generally. Now, we've inherited, all of us were born into a world where a zoo tradition was powerful, had made a difference to many people, and we are heirs to that. It is a complex tradition with a very, very complex past. Thankfully, it's much better today than it was a century ago in many, many important respects. That's to be applauded. Um, we will make our own choices by how we work with it, by how we try to see its future, and we make a choice as well if we simply ignore the future possibilities and keep what we have presently. So there's no simple neutral act here. Whatever we do, try to change it, keep it as it is, is ethically charged generally. That's why I'm suggesting that any persistent failure to truly aggressively, robustly engage what we're doing with regard to zoos is something, is a, a strategy whereby we imprison ourselves generally. Now, what does this have to do with zoos' futures? Well, the ethical impulses are an integral, integral part of our human nature. I think all of us know we're in a culture that touts how we are a morally, well, potentially moral species, perhaps, but we certainly have this capability as individuals. Um, it's the, the simple fact that we talk ethics in many different ways as part of our cultural heritage, part of our educational system, part of our religious traditions, and it's certainly part of the way we deploy our sciences, even if we take the position that sciences should be done in a values-free way. But they're certainly deployed in values-loaded ways, generally. So um, let's see what ethics discussion is uh, in terms of an academic teaching context, because this is quite an important point I want to make about ethics in this kind of a discussion generally. Um, it's not about dictating a particular content. It can be about that in an indirect way, but I want to suggest to you something there's something far more primary about ethics reflection, ethics engagement, ethics life generally, other than insisting that everybody else should live as you do, make the choices that you make generally. Um, let me come at this in a slightly different way. The dismissal of ethics by some. I've worked in institutions where it was commonly said that ethics is a matter of mere opinion. We're science literate, science focused here. Ethics is a matter of mere opinion. Now that's heavy dismissive rhetoric for a fundamental human skill, and it misses the really fundamental nature of ethical inquiry, which is about how we process our own thinking, how we reflect back. As John Coe said, it's about how we look at our biases. We see what our justifications are. We take out of the hidden light, a hidden darkness, the justifications and assumptions that drive us to the particular decisions or policies that we want to put in place generally. Ethics is about increasing self-awareness about the justifications you're willing to use and about the reasoning patterns you use to get there so others can look at your reasoning and your values and say, I'm troubled by that for this reason or for that generally. So the key ethical inquiry is a process of uncovering assumptions that drive you where you think you want to go generally. And it also helps you, once you're able to do that with yourself, see how others do that as well. In an ethics class, that is the primary skill you use. Teach people to see their own thinking, and they will get better at, at seeing others' thinking as well, generally. Failure to do that imprisons someone in a very tough place for them to get out of on their own. If you work at this process, hidden assumptions and values simply can't be bootlegged into a discussion into decisions, into policy, into law, into justifications generally. 
It helps you avoid fundamentalisms, which exist in almost every domain of our science, as we all know from polarized discussions in one area after another. So regarding our visions of how we think you should live, of course, this kind of process skill helps us get to fairly good judgments about what might be wrong, what might be right, and we can propose that to others. But each of us must cross this great divide on our own. We can also, if we're careful with this, avoid political correctness, mm, rationalizations that lead only to institutional advantage or to self-perpetuation or to prioritizing abolition when there are many other skills or other options available generally in the world. So I've suggested to you ethics is about process. It's not about right and wrong at first. It's certainly about um, that, but only after you've done those initial processing tasks. Those are the critical skills to confer in an eth ethics discussion. Okay, we get better at that as we do it more and more, and we really can help each other see this. And that's one of the reasons that diversity in a panel like this helps, because you can see from someone else's comments on your own, ah, I'm making that particular assumption, I didn't realize that, and you then can soar even further. With ethics, of that kind, that process, that self-examination process, you can ask some wonderfully interesting questions about zoos, and this pertains to the future. Will there ever be a time when zoo leaders recommend that cap captivity is for ethical reasons, too problematic for some non-human animals? This question frames some fundamental issues that must be distinguished, from, of course, from the technical problems like our inability to get certain animals to breed in captivity. This is an ethics question. Let's assume we can create all the options we want for them to breed. But we might ask the fundamental question um, about the animals themselves. Um, what I'm trying to do is ask us with regard to certain large, particularly large mammals, social mammals, if there are problems in captivity that should lead us as ethical animals to say their realities are such that we don't want to put them into captivity. Um, let me see if I can frame this in a slightly different way. Will future zoos recommend that some non-human animals simply do not belong in captivity because they, like human animals, are so complex mentally and socially, emotionally, that they suffer when in captivity, even if kept healthy and well-fed. Even if their presence educates us, we recognize that their presence in captivity harms them. In other words, the focus is on them, not on us, not on any human advantage whatsoever, good or bad. I will suggest to you that if we're silent on that question about whether or not their realities are such that we as ethical animals want to pay attention to it, that captivity practices will imprison us. And it will imprison our imagination to live in the kinds of worlds that David described, John described, so many other people have been um, describing as well. It will also imprison our, child, our children's hearts and minds as we go forward. So with those thoughts in, minds, let me, th thoughts in mind, let me see if I can ask you some questions about zoos, what zoos will look like in 50 to 100 years. I'm not a zoo person, as you can tell from my comments. Um, but I thought of this as we came across this theme. Hallmark number one of what they look like in 50 to 100 years, talking freely. And without the pretense that non-zoo, non-science people have nothing to add. Hallmark number two, asking hard questions as both science and ethics prompt us so well to do. The science tradi tradition asks us to openly, publicly question again, again, and then again. And same with ethics generally. Hallmark number three, actively seek interdisciplinary conversations. Hallmark number four, problematize human-centeredness, particularly because that's unscientific, <coughs> because that harms humans as well as non-humans. Problematize human-centeredness. Hallmark number five, be at home with the fact that we are members of a more than human community. We are human animals. We are primates, we are mammals. We live in a more than human community with lots of other than human animals. Be at home with that salient fact about our Earth. So why are we able to do this? 
in part because we're scientifically gifted, in part because we're ethically able. We're simply remarkable animals in this regard, and we regularly exhi exhibit an animal ability, namely caring about others. It's a mammalian ability we inherited. And we do this remarkably well when we're humble enough to come away from our inherited human-centerednesses, and we are careful enough to notice and take seriously the larger community that we live in, namely a multi-species world generally. We're also able to do this because we are free by virtue of the commitments of our scientific communities to do this, our political communities when they're at their best, um, to things like free speech, diverse voices, and living and leaving a better world for future generations of all kinds of animals, humans and non-humans -human, alike. So while it's true, the future of zoos might take forms that I could say imprison us in narrow-minded, human-centered versions that have prevailed in too many circles, such as the law circles in which I teach, in some education circles, in a far more exciting way. The other part of the subtitle pertains here, and that is that the future of zoos, lived according to our scientific and ethical abilities, can clearly, clearly liberate us. Thank you.